Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this very special program of the Harry and Rose Sampson Family Jewish Community Center. I'm Jody Hirsch. I'm the Director of Judaic Education. Um, this is a program of tapestry, which is arts and ideas at the JCC. So I would like to introduce Maureen Luddy. Um, really, this, this was Maureen's brainchild. Um, and it was thanks to her generosity that we could do this fabulous program and that we could invite Dr. Crane um, to, to, to address us today. So I'm gonna turn over the baton to Maureen. Thank you. Good evening. On behalf of my husband, David, who's in London, and my son, Noah, I want to welcome you all to the first annual Luddy Lecture Series in honor of my parents, Morton Claire Commissar. My parents were married for 63 and a half years until my dad's death in January of 2014. They shared a passion for each other, our family, ballroom dancing, often on cruises, and most importantly, meeting new people and learning new things through lectures around the world. Their favorite lecturer by far was always Dr. Tim Crane. They began to audit his classes in the early 2000s, became friendly with him, and would follow him anywhere in the area to hear him speak. I finally had a chance to hear Dr. Crane at the Lux, at the Lux Center last fall and immediately appreciated his charisma, intellect, and breadth of knowledge and came up with the idea of sponsoring this lecture series to share Dr. Crane with the community. I am so grateful to the staff of the Harry and Rose Sampson JCC Tapestry Program, especially Jody Hirsch, Rabbi Sherry Sharma, Mona Cohn, and Harriet Rothman for helping with the planning, and to the Nathan and Esther Peltz Holocaust Education Research Center, the Lex Center for Catholic Jewish Studies, the Jewish Community Relations Council of the Milwaukee Jewish Federation, Jewish Museum Milwaukee, Ovation High Point, where my mother Claire is watching. Hi, Mom. BBYO Wisconsin Region, and the Sherry and Steve Sadik Camp Interlock and JCC's TOEB Committee for co-sponsoring and advertising the event, and to each one of you who's participating in the Zoom call. Dr. Crane is a historian, professor, and administrator. His area of specialization is modern Jewish history, modern European history, and the Middle East. Dr. Crane is the former director of the National Catholic Center for Holocaust Education at Seton Hill University, and he previously taught for 15 years at Marquette University, my dad's alum, alma mater, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison, my alma mater. He is a recipient of numerous teaching and professional awards, including receiving Marquette University's Alumni Award for Leadership Excellence. I can think of no more important time than the present to learn the lessons of history and act for tikkun olam, repair of the world. In 2016, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, the former chief rabbi of the Commonwealth, in a speech to the European Parliament, referred to anti-Semitism as a mutating virus, stating that the hate that begins with Jews never ends with the Jews. It always goes on to other groups. So in this time of the COVID virus, an election year, and raising anti-Semitism and racism, I am so pleased that we can all learn together from Dr. Crane, and then hopefully use our knowledge individually and collectively to take action against hate in any form and make the world a better place. Regardless of your politics, it starts with voting tomorrow and in November for candidates that will help to end the hatred. Thanks to each of you for joining us and for what you will each do in the future. And now let's all learn together from Dr. Crane. Thank you so very much. Can everybody hear me okay? I trust. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. Thank you so much to the Luddy family for sponsoring this three-part series. Uh, as I was listening in over the past couple of minutes, I kept thinking, I feel like I'm back in front of the home team here, effectively. So it's uh, uh, tremendous, tremendous to be with you. 
And one of the greatest blessings in my entire life, uh, right out of the gate to formally begin this series, uh, is the many friendships that I made over the course of a good many years with members of the Milwaukee Jewish community. I will never ever forget the kindness, the way I was received, uh, the tremendous support that I received over the years. I've been very, very blessed and very fortunate. This was particularly true of Mort and Claire Commissar. And hello to you, Claire. Uh, Maureen told me you'd be watching, so I, I hope all is well. I miss you very much. And Mort is a blessed memory. Uh, for the two of them, I had them as auditors for a good many years. And it was a sense here of, uh, as time went on, in terms of seeing them time and time again, uh, appear at different intervals here, uh, uh, various lectures or lecture series that I did with the JCC or different synagogues or other venues as well throughout southeastern Wisconsin. And it was always a sense, it was always a great deal of fun to, to see them and to talk with them. And I can recall one time in particular at Congregation Emmanuel in Waukesha as I was heading out uh, to or going into the synagogue for the evening's presentation. And I was thinking, I'm not going to know anybody as I'm driving in the parking lot. And I thought, I bet that Mort and Claire are going to be there. And sure enough, as soon as I walked in, they were seated right there in the front seat. So I guess they'd be qualifying there as groupies or something along those lines. But it's, uh, uh, it's, it's great to have this opportunity. And I look forward here to our, our time together on what, quite frankly, is a fairly depressing topic um, in terms of looking at the, the past uh, as well of anti-Semitism and coming in as well onwards into the, the present day and projecting as well into the future. Well, to formally begin, as a historian, we go all the way back. We go all the way back here. We're very comfortable with things that are at least 50 years old, and that's for the most part we're going to be doing, obviously, this evening. But what I'd like to start, in fact, it's the three-year anniversary tomorrow and a three-year anniversary of the Unite the Right rally. The Unite the Right rally here in Charlottesville is a case of this movement of white nationalism. White nationalism, August 11th was the opening night, where they, in essence, mimicked, quite frankly, the torch rallies that were so prominent during the historic Third Reich. And from my standpoint, I quite frankly couldn't believe what I was seeing here in the United States, in this nation in 2017. And immediately it took me back to a very dear friend of mine from the Milwaukee Jewish community uh, of blessed memory, Dr. Diney Tuckman. And Diney and I were very, very good pals. We traveled together to Israel, we traveled together to Ireland. And we used to get in these very in-depth conversations in terms of anti-Semitism and how things were going. And I was, Diane would always call the idealist. And I stress the fact that anti-Semitism, particularly in this nation, and especially since the end of World War II, had been on a steady decline. It was on a steady decline. There was, in essence, a, a thing of the past. And Diane used to say, well, I'm not as optimistic. I think that in this country, and in Europe, that it's going to become more and more of an issue. And on this opening night of August 11th, 2017, uh, Diney's words were echoing because I thought he was correct. And indeed, it is something, this longest hatred, that never does in fact go away. And on the second day, the second day, as they got together here for the rally, Seeing, first and foremost, the Confederate flags as a historian, as a, a historian who focuses on modern Jewish history and going back to the standpoint of the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, or I should say the rebirth in the 1920s, it was something very upsetting. But adding to that was seeing the swastika flying in this nation. And not only as a modern Jewish historian and seeing the dangers firsthand time and time again of anti-Semitism, but also the fact of my father who was a World War II veteran and fought 
in the European theater. And as a kid growing up in the city of Milwaukee, my hometown, my dad would tell myself and as well as my brothers and sisters stories of what he saw in terms of the aftermath of the Holocaust and the closing stages of the Second World War. Probably one of the formal reasons I was interested in history and became interested as well in Jewish history. And I thought, quite frankly, seeing this on the second day and not just this photograph, countless more like them, what the hell is going on? This is the United States. We're better than this. Well, unfortunately, old bigotries die a very slow death. And you have this surge of anti-Semitism, this global phenomena continuing. And it's not just in the United States, it's not just in the Middle East, it is also, of course, in where it became most prominent early on in Europe. This is a Jewish cemetery, of course, that had been desecrated. This is in the nation of Poland from a few years ago. What we see here with this longest hatred is we see this problem, quite frankly, that never goes away. One of my favorite comments regarding anti-Semitism and the insanity or the stupidity of it all is that anti-Semitism is due to two things, the Jews and the bicyclists. And immediately the question becomes, why the bicyclists? Well, the answer to that is, why the Jews? It's something here that over the course of centuries does not go away. Intolerance, unfortunately, is a part of our past. And you see racism and prejudice and discrimination, the negative aspects here of civilization. Well, what we're going to look at this evening is going all the way back thousands of years to what we see as this longest hatred, in particular, looking at Christian hostility towards its sister faith of Judaism. Well, going all the way back in time, all the way back in time here, thousands of years, we can go off to Hebrew civilization and to the great patriarch of the Jewish people, Abraham. Origins around 1900 before Common Era. Abraham is the great patriarch of the Jews. He is the great patriarch of the Christians. He is the great patriarch of the Muslims. He's like this interfaith superstar, quite frankly. Well, you see this individual who is going to be, in terms of embracing this whole concept of monotheism, a belief in one God and one God only. Over the course of ancient history, religious belief was important, but the vast majority of civilizations were polytheists, worshiping here anywhere from two to hundreds of gods and goddesses. And what makes this civilization different, what makes it unique, is going to be this monotheism. One God and one God only. Well, as the centuries progress, this nomadic people early on are going to be enslaved by the Egyptians. Jewish history, of course, as we all know, is very depressing. The first of many, many depressing aspects of it. And you see here, Moses, this historic figure, is gonna rise, when I think of Moses, I think of Charlton Heston looking very, 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 very strong, don't mess with me type of individual. Well, Moses is going to solidify this monotheism, and he will also add to this the Ten Commandments. In the ancient world, the concern here on the part of the polytheistic civilizations is we do not know what the gods expect of us. From the standpoint of the commandments, it became crystal clear, we know exactly what the supreme being expects of us ethical conduct. Well, it would be this historic figure of Moses, whose life would be nicely compartmentalized in 40, 40, and 40 years, living to be 120, who would lead, he would lead here, the chosen people to the promised land. He's not allowed to enter into the promised land, but he leads them to the promised land. And you see this history that is going to be difficult as the centuries progress. We move onwards, we have the Assyrians, who are in fact are going to conquer the northern part 
of Hebrew civilization or what the 10 lost tribes, historic Israel, gone forever. The southern part of Judah, as well as the capital city of Jerusalem, will remain. But in 586 before Common Era, the Babylonians are going to sack Jerusalem and raise the temple to the ground and enslave here thousands upon thousands of Jews after killing thousands as well. Well, it begins as Babylonian captivity, but for this civilization, for this people, what will happen is that eventually the Persians defeat the Babylonians and they're able to go back to their homeland. And for the Jews, as they're more commonly known as now, the future is not going to be any easier, not by any stretch of the imagination. For looming on the horizon is an even more prominent civilization, an even more militaristic civilization, the Romans. And for the Jews, who will be the first civilization in history to write their own national story, it's not a history for the historian, it's to describe here the covenant of God with his chosen people. What you have over the centuries as the Hebrew Bible is being written, you will have a civilization that militarily remains fairly weak. Politically, there's a lot of disagreements. Things aren't all that well, quite frankly, in terms of Jews getting along, which I know could be somewhat of a surprise. Well, here, here, the Romans are going to begin emerging as this very prominent civilization. And for the Romans, what they did, what they did is they were this civilization with the centerpiece being the capital city, the imperial city of Rome. They would expand, expand here across, their control across the boot of historic Italy, as well as in the southern parts of historic Europe. And once they defeated the Carthaginians in North Africa, the road was in fact formally open, open to an incredible expansion. You can see on the slide that I'm putting up in orange, you can see the full extent here of the Roman Empire. But by the time they get to Syria, by the time they get to an area of what the, refer, the Romans referred to as Palestina, or what is also referred to as Judea, as well as Egypt, the Romans have such a massive slave population from this conquest that they've been involved with here for decades, that they don't need any more slaves. Indeed, the Romans will have the largest slave population, the largest slave population the world had ever known. And what the Romans are faced with instead is they're faced with here a concern of slave revolts. It became very, very common. So the Syrians, the Jews, the Egyptians, they're not going to be enslaved. The Romans will keep an eye on them, they're under Roman jurisdiction, but they're not going to be enslaved. And the Romans are more concerned in terms of solidifying their control across the area. Well, slave revolts would begin in earnest and slave revolts had already taken place beginning with the major uprising of Spartacus in the year 73 before Common Era, before the Roman legions even rolled into historic Judea and the city of Jerusalem. And in the slave uprising launched by Spartacus, it took the Roman soldiers, the Roman armies, three years to defeat this. Over 10,000 slaves here joined with Spartacus. Well, eventually by 70 before Common Era, the Romans are able here to put this slave revolt, bring it to defeat. It hit a little too close to home. It was too close to the imperial city of Rome itself. So what the Romans did is they decided to send a message, to send a very clear message. And this very clear message would be to all slaves throughout the Roman Empire or anybody who stood up as viewed as somebody is an insurrectionist. And if you get out of line, you're getting whacked. And what happens here is crucifixion is introduced. And along this 150 mile road in 70 before Common Era, from Rome all the way to Capua, 6,000 slaves who had been 
followers of Spartacus. Spartacus had been captured. He had already been executed. They're going to be crucified. And when you're crucified, you step up on this wooden, it's basically like a, just a little bit of a step right off the, the bottom of the cross. And in the vast majority of cases, you're tied to the cross. And you're going to be hanging here in the hot summer sun. And as human beings, we can go a long time without any food. We can't let go very long at all without water. And what eventually would happen is just as you were about to die from thirst, the Roman legions would come by with the equivalency of a big baseball bat and they'd shatter your legs. Now you would slowly suffocate to death. It was the most, it was the most awful way of all in terms of dying here. And the Romans preserved this for those who were enemies of the state. Well, after 200 years, after 200 years of this blood and iron movement to cross the empire and reducing the Mediterranean Sea to a Roman lake, the Romans would experience this time of stability. Under the leadership of Augustus Caesar, the grandnephew of the assassinated Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar would eventually here solidify his control in 31 before Common Era, this new emperor. And he would rule the Roman Empire from 31 before Common Era all the way until his death in 14 in the Common Era. And he ushers in this time period of the Pax Romana, or little translation Roman peace. And you have, from this time for the next 200 years, all the way through the reign of Marcus Aurelius in the year 180 in the Common Era, peace and stability throughout the empire with one notable exception. And the one notable exception is Palestina, or Palestine, as the Romans also referred to it as. And what's going on here in this stage is the Jews in this region are unhappy. They've been unhappy for quite some time. Something here that the Roman high command back in the capital city, are very much aware of. But what the Romans do is something unprecedented. The Romans are going to take a Roman polytheist, a gentleman by the name of Herod the Great, and they're going to make him the Roman puppet king, so to speak. He's answerable to the Romans, but it was easier, the Romans believed, than having an actual military commander there. Well, Herod the Great will become this ruler over the Jewish people in 37 before Common Era. And he will set off on this policy of public works. He knows, the Romans know, the Jews aren't happy. He's completely aware of that. But what he does is the Romans are good engineers and he's going to build bridges and roads. He is going to go so far as to rebuild this temple for the one Jewish God that the Babylonians had destroyed all the way back in 586 BC. The goal, the objective, the focus, as the Romans are kind of doing an about face here, is to make Jerusalem the second most beautiful city in the entire empire, second only to Rome itself. And indeed, by 20 before Common Era, it is. Well, the Jews of Palestine are still not happy. They're still not happy. And collectively, they would all prefer to be independent. It was nothing personal. They didn't want to be dominated by the Egyptians and enslaved by the Egyptians or dominated and enslaved by the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the Romans, for that matter. They didn't want any control. It's nothing personal. But these Jewish groups have different outlooks in terms of how this should be approached, how, in fact, it should be approached. And the first group of the Sadducees, and the Sadducees who overwhelmingly reside in the city of Jerusalem, as far as they're concerned is, hey, as Jews, the Romans have done a great deal of good. Herod has done a great deal of good here, there's no doubt about that. The infrastructure has improved immensely. The wisest course of action for us Jews is to work within these confines and hope that things continue to improve. Probably a bit more realistic. What are our options, the Sadducees would say? We rise up, they're gonna crush us, just like they crushed everybody. The Greeks, the Carthaginians, you name it. The second group of the Pharisees, the Pharisees, 
and the Pharisees are anticipating a Messiah. Literal translation, anointed one. Now, the Pharisaic version here of this Messiah is very political. Classic example, he fits in very well with Bar Kokhba over a century later. It's going to be a political thing. We are going to know it is the Messiah when he rescues us from Roman domination. Rescues us here from Roman domination. Now listen close. There is nothing. There is nothing in the writings of the Pharisees that talk of the Messiah dying to cleanse the world of original sin. Nothing. How we know it's the Messiah? Well, the Son of Man, we will know it is him when he rescues us from Roman domination. The second major Jewish group, very prominent as well in the city of Jerusalem. The Essenes are anticipating, they're anticipating here the end of the world. They're very spiritual. They're cut off here, kind of in their own communes. And from the Essenes' perspective, it's more of this meditation, this otherworldly outlook. If you read a great deal of the literature from this time period in the Roman Empire and in this area, you get the, the feeling that the end of the world is going to be coming very, very soon. Well, the last group of the Zealots, the Zealots. And from the Zealots' perspective, the best way we could describe them as uh, the consummate realists. As far as these Jews are concerned, listen, Jews, the only thing the Romans understand is the use of force. If we want our freedom, if we want our independence free here of the control of Augustus Caesar and the Roman armies, we have to arm ourselves and rise up in open rebellion, the zealots. Well, the Romans are very much aware that in this time of the Pax Romana, stability across the entire area, across the entire Mediterranean, with the one exception, Palestine, they're very, very much aware that there are these major underlying issues and they're paying particular attention to the zealots and to anybody who may be a zealot. And the Romans are becoming all the more impatient here as the years in fact progress. Because as far as they were concerned, they did so much for the Jews. They treated them so kindly, and this is the thanks they get? Potential rebellion looming on the horizon? Well, in four before common era, Herod the Great dies. He dies. And he will divide the kingdom between his three sons, but it doesn't go well. They're not as competent as he is. And eventually what the Romans decide, what Augustus Caesar decides is to cut the crap. And from that time onwards, the Roman soldiers are going to bring a Roman military general in here, especially around the time of important days in the Jewish calendar. And if you get out of line, you're getting whacked, plain and simple. Enough was enough. The tension, therefore, in Jerusalem, as well as throughout the region, was fairly high. And it is in this tense environment that Jesus of Nazareth is born. Now, Jesus of Nazareth is born. He is born here in the Roman Empire, probably at the year four before Common Era. It could have been as late as the year one in the common era, somewhere in that five-year time frame. And for Jesus, what we know about him, what we know about him is as follows. He is born a Jew, he lives his entire life as a Jew, and he dies, he dies believing he is Jewish. Dies believing he is Jewish. He's a challenge for the historian. He's not a challenge for the theologian. He's a challenge for the historian. And he's a challenge for the historian because first and foremost, he never wrote down anything. The book of Jesus. Here's my early life. The teen years were particularly challenging. We don't have that. Now, it doesn't, make he, that doesn't mean he's impossible. Socrates, 
from centuries earlier in Greek civilization, he never wrote anything down either. And we know a great deal about him from his prized pupil, Plato. What's well, the first challenge, nevertheless? And the second challenge about Jesus is for the first 30 years of his life, he's living in virtual obscurity. He begins his public ministry at the age of 30, and his public ministry lasts one to three years at most. That's it, one to three years. So we know very little about him for his first 30 years. And that way, it's kind of like you have uh, the historical figure of Moses. Okay? And with Moses, we know very little in terms of Moses as the infant, and then suddenly Moses is his prince of Egypt. Okay? So we kind of gloss over those first 40 years. It's similar here with Jesus. He begins his public ministry when he is immersed in water by John the Baptist, somebody that the Romans are keeping a close eye on. He's a troublemaker as far as they're concerned. Jesus of Nazareth may have been a follower of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is preaching that the end of the world is going to be coming very, very soon, right out of the Essene tradition. Well, his public ministry that lasts one, no longer than three years, is going to be a very rural ministry in the area of the Galilee. It is almost as though he is avoiding the city of Jerusalem completely. And in this ministry, he will do a great deal of preaching, the importance of love and forgiveness, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. He'd perform all sorts of miracles. He would turn water into wine. He raised a friend of his, Lazarus, from the dead. He raised a teenage girl who had also died. He raised her from the dead. And it's a case that with this historical figure, he's attracting a fairly large group of followers who will be known as the Nazarenes, these Jewish followers of Jesus. Well, at some point, with Passover approaching, he decides to enter the city of Jerusalem. And he's entering Jerusalem at a time when the Roman governor general is a gentleman by the name of Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate is a complete thug. He's a classic example of somebody you don't mess with, you're going to mess with them, you're going to be killed. You're going to be crucified. That simple. Well, he goes into the city of Jerusalem, and if you read the accounts, virtually everything he's doing in Jerusalem, you're thinking, this guy's going to get himself killed. He's upsetting, he's angering a lot of people. And what happens here is he is arrested as a rabble rouser, as a troublemaker, and he's going to be given this death sentence. And the stories that continue on, the gospels that tell here, the four major gospels that tell the life and times of Jesus of Nazareth, you know, the gospel accounts perhaps most striking of all in the gospel of John, that he is debating back and forth with Pontius Pilate, Jesus and, and Pontius Pilate. And at one stage, you have Pontius Pilate pointing Jesus out to the mob off his balcony, the Jewish mob who are yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And Pontius Pilate suddenly looks like Rebecca of Donnybrook Farm. It's like, I see nothing wrong with this man. And he's going to wash his hands of what is going to befall this unfortunate individual. He then hands Jesus over to them to be crucified. Well, them the impression is he's giving them to the Jews. The reality is he's going to be executed in a classic form of Roman execution, crucifixion. The following day, Jesus of Nazareth will be executed. He'll be nailed to the cross, which was also not as common as being tied to the cross. And after three hours, he would die. Because of the looming Sabbath, his, they allowed for him to be taken down from the cross and buried, but he was hastily buried. And his followers on this Friday, then they came back on Sunday morning to finish the burial. And they found the stone was removed and he was gone. For the Nazarenes, they then stressed that over the course of the next 40 days, he appeared to them with the wounds that he had here from the crucifixion. And they watched the number 40. Of course, it's big in Judaism. It's big in Christianity. It's also big in Islam. They watched here as he formally ascended into heaven. 
as far as this small group was concerned, the Nazarenes, this guy was the Messiah. This guy was the Messiah. No doubt about it. But from the framework here of the Jews, nobody's looking for a Messiah except the Pharisees. So what do the Nazarenes do? They go after the Pharisees. This Nazarene tradition represents the perfection of our Jewish faith. Well, as far as the Pharisees are concerned, this guy's gone. He's out of the picture. He could not have been the Messiah. He didn't do what he was supposed to do. We're still dominated by the Romans. Well, for the Nazarenes, in the years that passed, what they were anticipating first and foremost was the second coming. That Jesus was going to be coming back down from heaven to preside over final judgment. Well, it didn't happen. A number of years passed, a number of more years passed. And for the Nazarenes, they saw themselves as working within the Jewish tradition. In fact, even after you have the establishment of these early Christian churches, many Jews were also, uh, many of these Christians, were also still going to synagogue because the faiths were so similar or viewed as such. Well, Saul of Tarsus, who is Jewish, Saul of Tarsus, who is also here a Roman soldier, is going to experience in the road, or I should say on the road to Damascus, this spiritual conversion, and he becomes the second most important person in this history of Christianity. And what you have with Saul of Tarsus, or Paul of Tarsus, now known in Christian annals as St. Paul, is he becomes this missionary machine, traveling throughout the entire Roman Empire. What had been a very rural movement on the part of Jesus' short public ministry, this becomes a very urban movement going to major cities, to Rome, to Alexandria, writing these different letters then too, talking about the good news that he sees not just for Jews, but also for Gentiles, for these Roman polytheists. This is a representation of the perfection as far as he is concerned of monotheism. Well, he'll write like Paul the, Paul the Ephesians, Paul to the Romans, Paul to Timothy, Paul to the Corinthians, the list goes on and on. And these letters, will make up a good part of an add-on to the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, as well as the four Gospels, the Gospel of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and Gospels of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Well, here, in these letters of Paul, and you also see it as well in some of the Gospel accounts, Matthew's, but also especially in John's, there's this anger, there's this frustration. John's Gospel is written somewhere between 90 to 100 in the Common Era final gospel written. And this anger, this hostility towards their fellow Jews, that the mass conversion of Jews has not taken place. They'll have some early success with the Zoroastrians, this Persian religion, and they're really focusing on the Roman polytheists who are worshiping Jupiter and Juno and Mars and Venus, so on and so forth. But there's this undertow of anger. For example, in the letters of Paul, the Christians will be viewed as the children of light, while the Jews are viewed as the children of darkness. In the Gospel of John, you see as well this hostility permeating a good deal of his writing, this anger that's there these writings are going to be used to justify Christian anti-Judaism. For these two faiths, they both in the Roman Empire are very small. But over the course here of the century that followed, the decades that followed the life and times, we have our first major ze zealot revolt in 67. It takes the Romans three years to put that down. It's followed by a second revolt. Eventually, the Romans decide here with these zealots and basically with all the Jews in their homeland that enough is enough. And they drive them out. They force them all out collectively, leading to this scattering, to this diaspora. This homeland had been the homeland of the Jews for over a thousand years and now. It's gone. It's destroyed. 
For Christianity by comparison, it sought here, it sought to expand, it sought to expand over the decades that followed, and it had fairly limited success. By the time we get to the 200s, as you can see on our slide here, those were some Christianized areas, but they were also very lightly populated. However, in the year 312 in Rome, the Emperor Constantine experiences here this revel re revelation as he's going off to battle at the Battle of Milvian Bridge of the following day that he makes a promise that if he succeeds here, this Roman polytheist, on the battlefield, which he needs to to preserve his rule, if he succeeds, he will convert to Christianity. His mother, Helen, is already a Christian, probably plays a major role in it. He succeeds on the battlefield, and the reports were on his deathbed in 338, he converted. Now, this religion is going to spread in a very, very significant fashion, even going so far as to outliving the fall of the Roman Empire itself in the year 476. The Roman Empire falls in 476. And what happens across historic Europe is it becomes this very decentralized entity Feudalism, manorialism eventually becomes more and more prominent. And from the standpoint of Jewish Christian relations, Jews will be scattered throughout the Middle East. They'll be scattered as well across North Africa. They will be scattered as well across historic Europe here after the fall of the Roman Empire and they represent a very small minority because coming forth from the Judeo-Christian tradition will be this third monotheistic faith, the religious faith of Islam, with its origins in the year 610 in the Common Era. Muhammad, a centerpiece here, this prophet in a long line of prophets going all the way back to Abraham and Moses. And you see this religious faith a proselytizing faith, just like Christianity is a proselytizing faith. Are you a Christian? You're not a Christian? Can I have just a few minutes of your time? I'm just going to try and help you. Just a few minutes. It's all I'm doing. Just a few minutes. Similar in that regard. Similar here in that regard. Compared to the foundation of monotheism, the religious faith of Judaism that both Christianity and Islam come from, you have here a population that's generally about 1% to 2% in the Islamic world, about 1% here in the European world. Well, Christians in Europe, they have no idea. They know nothing, next to nothing about Islam. They know next to nothing here about Islam. There are no Muslims living in Europe. What's a Muslim? There are Jews, however. And the Jews represent this tiny fraction of the population here as we're entering into the 800s and the 900s in the Common Era, hundreds of years after the establishment of this religious faith of Christianity. Well, if you're Jewish living in Europe in the 700s, and the 800s, the 900s, the goal, the focus, the objective was to basically make it through Easter, coinciding with Passover. Because it would be during this time, especially at the Good Friday services, that Christians, Christians would be in these cathedrals, in these churches, and they would hear the passion and death of Jesus of Nazareth. And it did not put Jews at the time, certainly, in a very positive light. Not at all. Not at all. So this was a time that you were, if you were Jewish living in medieval Europe, that you were most apt to be attacked. And usually Jews would be forced to wear some sort of clothing, some sort of yellow piece of clothing or a badge of sorts. As centuries progress, they have to wear a pointed yellow hat 
to basically give it away that you are dealing with a Jew. But it made them here more vulnerable to assault, to being ridiculed, for the sense of collective blame by the sister of religion. It's a vast majority of Christians who would see as the rock of Gibraltar of their faith, the Old Testament, was the Hebrew Bible. Guarantee you they didn't know that. In fairness, 97% of the European population was functionally illiterate at this time as well. Well, what happens in medieval Europe is this hostility, this anger coming from the sister faith of Christianity is going to begin reaching homicidal proportions. And we see this Christian anti-Judaism, this anger, this hostility, for as long as there was a Jew living in some God-forsaken town, some God-forsaken hamlet, as a Christian, it cast here a glimmer of doubt that my religion was the one and only true religion in the world. This could not be accepted, not in any way, shape, or form. As far as historic Christianity was concerned, historic Christianity, Roman Catholicism. And in 1095, we see our first example of homicidal Christian anti-Judaism. Pope Urban II will call the Crusades, this holy war, this holy war, to take Jerusalem and the surrounding Holy Land, the birthplace of Christianity, to take it away from the Muslim infidel. Well, Jerusalem, of course, is the most important city for Judaism. It is the most important city for Christianity. It is the third most important city for Islam. And with the expansion of the Islamic world, the historic Holy Land, from the Christian perspective, was in the hands now of the Muslim infidel. He calls Urban II, head of the Catholic Church, calls for this crusade, this holy war. And he has a volunteer army of over 100,000 soldiers. Before the Crusaders even set off to rescue the Holy Land from the Muslim infidel, you're going to see your first example of large-scale murder against the European Jews. It depended on the community, but tens of thousands of Jews will be killed by the Crusaders, for God wills this. God wills this. Now, the church was very careful in fairness because the church knew the foundation of its religion rested on Judaism, rested on the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, as they called it and call it. So, in essence, this tended to take on a life of its own. Well, the Crusaders are going to go off. And the first major Muslim and Jewish population that they run into as they're entering into the Islamic world is in Antioch in 1098. And they demand that the gates be opened to the city. And the Muslims and the Jews in Antioch said, okay, provided that nobody is injured. The gates are open, and the Crusaders proceed to slaughter every Muslim and Jew they can get their hands on. Continuing on, amidst the cries of God wills it in this religious zealotry out of control. They get all the way to Jerusalem in 1099, where once again, they will break into the city walls here. There are Jews living in Jerusalem at this time. There had been since the start of diaspora. The majority of the population are Muslims. It will lead to another mass murder. Hundreds of thousands of mostly Muslims, but also Jews, are going to die here during the Crusades. Well, what this does from the standpoint of the Muslims is they are going to call here for retaliation. They're going to call a jihad to recapture the Holy Land, to recapture Jerusalem for the rightful owners, them, which is going to lead us to more and more crusades. Eventually, the Muslims are able to recapture the Holy Land. The Christians are going to try to take it back. In the years that follow after 1187, they fail. What the crusades do is it really destroys the relationship between Christianity and Islam up to and including the present day, Muslim extremists in the present day will use the slurred crusader against Christians. By the same token, it is also going to lead to very serious problems, not surprisingly, between Jews and Christians. The Jews became the scapegoat group. You had problems in your life. It wasn't your fault. It was because of the Jew. 
plain and simple. And this tension there continued. From the Jewish perspective in Europe, the hope was that eventually things will settle down, we'll have some sense of normalcy. But in 1347, the Black Death began. This massive pandemic, the greatest pandemic, most destructive pandemic in all of human history. It would take nearly the lives of 30% of the European population within just a few years. Well, the Christians believed at first, they had no idea that it was being carried by rats and fleas that were feeding on these diseased rats and then biting humans. Initially, Christians believed that God is punishing us because we're a sinful and wicked people. But eventually, as the Black Death continued for two years with no end in sight, especially in high populated areas, they believed that something more sinister was at work, the Jew. And they argued, Christian populations, that the Jews were poisoning the wells, poisoning here the water supply. Well, this is going to lead towards a second massive assault, murderous assault against Jews across historic Europe. The Black Death, our second major example. The hostility continued. The Jews would be the other, forced to live with each other, forced eventually into ghettos across historic European civilization. They were in league with Satan himself as far as many Christians were concerned, involved in the black arts. At the end of the day, they were murderers of Christ, murderers of Jesus, and they are collectively responsible. Well, from the Jewish perspective, the hope was that eventually this would calm, would improve. Unfortunately, it didn't. And as the centuries progress, Coming forth is you have even more bizarre accusations. Accusations of ritual murder or blood libel as is also referred to as. This begins back in England with William of Norwich in the 1100s and Hugh of Lincoln in the 1200s and would start to spread in terms of folklore across historic Europe. Basically what it entailed is that Jews, especially around the time of Aesdark, were kidnapping, kidnapping Christian children and draining their blood for their bizarre Jew sacrifices. They needed the blood for Passover. This was what the line of reasoning was, the accusation was. Well, this was quite common and became more common. And in 1472, an Italian boy was born, Simon, and he went missing in 1475 only to be found murdered. His father accused the Trent Jewish community here in Italy of being responsible, of ritually murdering here his son. There'd been no classic signs or symptoms, the accusations where they, the Jews would sew the ears, the nose, the eyes, the mouth of their victims shut and drain all their blood. Well, this hadn't been the case, he'd been strangled. Nevertheless, the accusations take on a life of their own, and over 200 Trent Jews are tortured to death in retaliation for Simon. Well, the Christian church, the Catholic church, is going to get involved in this, and Simon of Trent, on the site where his body was found, a pilgrimage church is going to be built. Now, he is beatified, he is not sainted, but beatification is the first of a couple of legs to go through before you're formally sainted. And it becomes this tremendously prominent pilgrimage church in the years that followed. Well, in the Austrian Tyrol, in 1462, there had been an unsolved murder mystery of Andrew of Rin, also known as Andreas of Rin, also known as Andreas Oxner, O-X-N-E-R. And in this situation, Andrew of Rin, Andrew of Wynn, the murder was unsolved. Well, they decided it had to have been the Jews. There were no Jews living within 100 miles. But this was a case of ritual murder. Once again, the church got involved. The church got itself involved and formally built a second pilgrimage church where Andrew of Rin's bones had been found. Well, 
what happened, here's a statue actually of young Andrew. What happened is that if you had an unsolved murder mystery across historic Europe, immediately it became a case of Jewish ritual murder, or it could be a case of Jewish ritual murder. Obviously, it's a myth. And in 1759, Cardinal Ganganelli, who eventually becomes Pope Clement XIV, launched an investigation into all these accusations of Jewish ritual murder. And he concluded, he concluded that Jewish ritual murder here in 1759 is a myth. And this is good news for the Jews, with the exception of Simon of Trent and Andrew of Wren. Probably a lot of this had to do with the fact that there were huge pilgrimages to their churches still every single year. So it made financial sense for the church to keep them on the books. It is not until 1965 at the Second Vatican Council that these two individuals are formally removed and Jewish ritual murder is declared a myth once and for all. 1965. And as a Roman Catholic, I find that most upsetting, ridiculous, inexcusable, unforgivable. Well, the hostility continues. The Spanish Inquisition, which begins in 1483, you had here countless Jews who were given the choice to either leave Spain forevermore, go back to Islamic civilization, or follow the Muslims, the Moors, as they were known as, as they had been expelled following the Battle of Las Navas de Tolosa, across here the Straits of Gibraltar and into North Africa, or convert to Christianity. Well, many of these Jews converted. They converted, they had been in Spain for generations. They were known as the conversos. But as time went on, as time went on, they became known more and more as the Maranos. Because as Jews, they were second class citizens in Christian Spain. But now if they had been converted, if they were converted to Christianity, this would go on indefinitely. They'd be safe. They'd be covered. They could become attorneys. They could become physicians. They could become court ministers. They became all of those. It led to this backlash as the 1400s progressed, and they were known as the Maranos, the damned or the swine. The Spanish Inquisition, which begins in 1483, would eventually lead to the mass expulsion. Hundreds of Jews would be tortured to death during the Spanish Inquisition, it would lead to the mass expulsion, probably more than 300,000 Jews. The largest Jewish population in the world at that time resided in southern Spain, was formally removed. Christian anti-Judaism, therefore, is continuing. We get into the 1500s, the early 1500s. And Martin Luther, a Catholic monk, is looking for reform within the historic church reform here within the historic church, and wanted to bring things up to date. There's a great deal of superstition that needed to be removed, etc. And in 1517, he begins this reform movement within the historic Christian church, the Catholic church. And the Pope, at the time, Pope Leo, wanted nothing to do with this. If any sorts of changes were gonna come, it wasn't gonna come from this priest and this professor of theology at the University of Wittenberg in the Germanic lands, rather would come from the Pope himself. And what he does is he severs all ties with Luther. Well, Luther begins this Protestant Reformation with no other option. And you see the introduction of all these different Protestant religions, Lutheranism being first, Anglicanism, Calvinism, the list is on and on. And for the Jews, this represented something good. Hope. It seemed, quite frankly, that Protestantism was more intellectual, at least, than historic Christianity. Catholicism has been. Things couldn't have gotten any worse. And in 1523, Martin Luther writes, Jesus Christ was born a Jew, 1523. And in this, he basically extends a hand of friendship to the Jews. And he predicts the mass conversion of all the Jews to the one true Christian faith of Protestantism in the form of Lutheranism. Well, Luther should have done his homework because the Catholics have been trying it for centuries. The Muslims have been trying it for centuries to no avail. Why the Protestants are gonna have any more luck? Well, it's for Luther to sort out himself. Well, the mass conversion doesn't happen. And in 1543, 
Martin Luther writes the most anti-Semitic tract in all of human history on the Jews and their lies. And in this document, in this pamphlet, he encourages Protestants to do whatever you want to do to the Jews. Burn their synagogues, burn their Torah scrolls, beat them, force them to live in barns so they can get in touch with their own inferior nature. Sadly, this new form of Christianity isn't going to offer a great deal of hope either than had been the case with historic Christianity. What troubles me most in conclusion of part one of our three-part series, what's the most troubling about this is that Christianity should have been the greatest protector of its sister religion of Judaism. Not only, not only did Christianity fail to protect its sister faith, it became at times its greatest persecutor. And in part two of our series next Monday, we will continue on transitioning away, viewing the enlightenment, looking as well into the rise of modern anti-Semitism in 19th century Europe and bringing it into the 20th century. Thank you. Okay, so um, so um, I think we're at 8.30, but I think we'll um, take a, 10 minutes for some questions. Tim, do you wanna unshare your screen? Sure, sure, sorry. And um, okay, so some people ask questions. One question um, someone asked about the whole business of the crucifixion, you know, who was responsible? I mean, you mentioned that Pontius Pilate was a thug. Uh, I think this is actually a really deep question because a lot of what you were saying before about the blood libels and other things, you had mentioned that the Jews murdered Jesus. And so go back to your statement about Pontius Pilate being the thug. And mm -hmm. why, is it, why is it that Christians throughout all these generations um, why do they blame the Jews? Why, why was that? You, I mean, you said it was Pontius Pilate. So what's going on here? Absolutely. I think that there's a, it's a very good question. And, and it's, uh, it's an issue I can remember um, some years ago, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, uh, Jay Larkey of Blessed Memory, said, uh, if this was the fate of Jesus, and he knows it's his fate, he's going to Jerusalem, he knows he's going to be put to death, and he did. Why are the Jews held responsible for it? It doesn't make sense. And I'd say that really what it came down to is a sense of anger and frustration on the part that you've had this religion that is going to have a good deal of success in terms of expansion. Um, and, but the, uh, your own backyard, so to speak, has no interest in it whatsoever, none. And so when the, Gospels are being written, and John, again, is the last gospel to be written. Uh, and in fact, in John's gospel, Jesus dies on a completely different day uh, than he dies in the other three gospels. He dies before Passover. As the lambs are being led to slaughter, he's hanging on the cross uh, and, uh, and dying. And, and it's a case that, so you have this hostility. By the same token, there'll be other biblical historians, New Testament historians, who claim that, well, when Paul is writing and John is writing, they're writing these, Matthew's gospel is written exclusively for a Jewish audience. They're writing these at the time when the Romans are very hostile towards the Jews, uh, in general, in particular the Zealots, but are whitewashing all of them as insurrectionists. And so when these are being written in the, you know, in the first century here, it's a case of like, well, we're not Jews, we're Nazarenes, we're Christians, et cetera. We're not like them, we're not disloyal to Rome, et cetera. So how much of that plays a role, um, it's, it's difficult to determine, but it it's certainly is something that is going to remain. I oftentimes will say, if, if Christianity had remained small and Judaism would remain small, everything would have been fine. If Judaism had gotten large like Christianity, I think things would have been fine, it would have been safety in numbers. Right? I can remember some years ago as well, uh, a good friend, Paul Jacobs, I said in a, a presentation, Paul just celebrated his 90th birthday a few weeks ago. And I said to, I said in a presentation that if John or Paul knew how their writings were going to be used as the centuries progressed, they never would have said it. And Paul said, Tim, 
you can say just the exact opposite, that that's exactly how they wanted and they intended them for them to be used. And I said, you're right. So it's something that it's this tie that begins and it's eventually going to be viewed as we'll talk about next time in terms of the enlightenment, this whole concept of the, the Jews as ritual murderers, the Jews as Christ killers, this is medieval, it's obscurantist, it's, it's passe. So you have that change, but then the hostility, the scapegoating is still there. And then it's gonna transfer into modern anti-Semitism. So actually that segues something that you said, segues into what, something that one of the other people asked. And, and then you had mentioned that, that John, the gospel according to John, as we, you know, there was a kind of anti-Semitic tilt to it. So what, why is that? Why, why was John anti, more anti-Jewish than the other? Now, you mentioned that the others saw themselves as Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, was there something deeper than that? Well, with John, with John's gospel, it's written between, it's considered to be written between the years 90 to 100. Um, and it's, it's if the, what's considered to be of the gospels, the gospel that's uh, considered the most accurate for historians is the gospel of Mark, which is written somewhere between 60 to 65. It's the first gospel written. Then Luke and Matthew borrow heavily from uh, Mark. So what I mean by this is that some of the accounts of life and times of Jesus that are in Mark's gospel are also in Matthew's gospel are also in Luke's gospel. Matthew's gospel is written for a Jewish audience. Luke's gospel is written for a Roman audience. Luke's gospel is considered the best gospel of the uh, four that are written. The three are known collectively as the synoptic gospels. John's gospel is not really interested in terms of a, a historical line, chronological order. It's more of a case of it's, it's not synoptic like the first three, it's, it's more symbolic. Um, and, and for example, there'll be questions asked to Jesus. It's almost, and what he'll do is instead of having a reply, it almost it becomes something like a, a, you know, Hamlet going off to be or not to be. He goes off to try and answer a lot of questions and, and fill a lot of holes, so to speak. So he's not really interested in terms of the uh, accuracy, so to speak. Uh, but it's uh, the historical accuracy. He's more interested in terms of solidifying the life and times and what this ultimately means. So like in John's gospel, the I'm sorry, Mark's gospel, it's the crowd that was opposed to Jesus. There were people in the crowd who were opposed. In John's gospel, it's the Jews. And so, and you have like, uh, uh, it, it, this, this interplay going back and forth. And the problem, the problem is that it's these uh, texts that are used to justify in the, in the years that followed to, to justify this hostility. And it's, it's something that, again, as, a, as a, a modern Jewish historian and as a Roman Catholic, I mean, steps have been taken, we'll get into this most certainly. Um, Rabbi David Rosen, who I think a great deal of, calls uh or has stated on a number of occasions that roman catholicism is the best friend that judaism has now um i don't know if that's true i don't know if i'd give my fellow uh, catholics and catholic faith in general uh that credit but if that is reality uh it certainly is something long overdue because it's embarrassing it really 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 is embarrassing the past and it, it what the things that happen because what you do is you if you remove, and it's something I think is stated as a final sentence, if you remove this legacy of Christian anti-Judaism, I do not believe that the mass murder of the European Jews in the Second World War would have taken place. And I think that is something that Catholicism, Protestantism is still trying to come to grips with uh, in, in, the, in the present. And it's a pretty heavy burden to bear, but if you remove that framework, because the same framework is gonna be used for modern anti-Semitism, the same scapegoating, the same crap that we see in Charlottesville in 2017, we're gonna see in the 19th century. We learn nothing from history, unfortunately. So some people are asking about the future which you're gonna be talking about. I just, just you know, to think about for, for future times, um, you know, that there was a question about, 
the Italian Catholic Church and the kidnapping of Jewish children in the 1800s. Don't tell us anything about that now, but it's something that maybe you might want to you might want to think about. Um, um, there was a question about will there be more on modern anti-Semitism? Of course. I mean, what we're doing right now is looking at the underpinnings of it. Um, here's a question. Um, from one of our listeners. When I was a kid, I heard that since peace had not descended on the world, Jesus could not have been the Messiah. How do Christians rationalize that? Um, and um, yeah, and you know, so that's that's part of this big picture of the underpinnings of Christian anti-Semitism, right? And I want to connect that with another thing. So if this is part of, this is an important question, but you mentioned that the Second Vatican Council Mm -hmm. didn't rule against these blood libels until the 1960s. Last, it's, what, it's a, it's a, what took them so long? Why? What, what kept question. them from making a policy decision that said, no, the Jews did not kill Christ, and these people, these, you know, the Jews did not kill children? Yeah, that's, that's a, 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 an excellent question, and it's something that's, that's very, very uh, upsetting, quite frankly. And if you look at, uh, with Nostra Aetate, uh, little translation on October 28th, 1965 in our time. Their steps are certainly taken. And it's not just, it's not just towards Judaism. It's also, also towards Islam. I mean, in, in, in terms of religious violence, we have a horrible track record. We have the worst track record of all in Christianity. Uh, um, and I'd say Catholicism has, has the worst, but in fairness, Catholicism has been around 2,000 years. Protestants only been around five, uh, Protestantism has been around 500 years. So, so it's it's something that you know is is certainly uh, uh, an issue, and why they still were uh, a leftover hangover, so to speak, from the 1700s. Perhaps I mean you get into it, which we'll also talk about as well, uh, or tie in in our uh, our three part series of what is very very controversial with Pius the Twelfth. Um, and of course, now with the archives open, it's interesting to see uh, uh, what comes forth, if anything, of relevance, one way or the other, in in that regard. But I, I think it's a sense that it, it, the Holocaust. I would say that if you don't have the mass murder of the European Jews in World War II, I do not see uh, any reference, any major changes in Jewish Catholic relations. I think it was something that. There were, uh, and granted, there were countless convents. There were countless monasteries who hid Jewish children. And, and if you want to talk righteous Gentiles, more were Catholic than Protestant in World War II, few and far between. But there were more Catholics, almost a two to one rate, who saved Jewish children than Protestants. But the thing with Catholics is they tried to convert them, whereas Protestants did it for pure humanitarian reasons. So. You, you still have these issues. I mean, it's that there's still a long, long way to go. A, a first bridge had been thrown across, but, and it's something that you'll find more so, I would say, at least with, uh, uh, with most Protestant churches and, and, uh, uh, and the Catholic church that will immediately uh, put down anti-Semitism or any anti-Semitic references when they come. So it's, it's, well, it's about time and it's uh, in that regard, but there's still a long way to go. It's a little, in my opinion, too little, too late. So I wanna ask two more quick questions and then I'm gonna ask you to just tell us in two sentences what we have in store for us next week and the following week. But first, two, one question about the, the Eastern Christian church and one about Islam. So, so was there anti-Semitism in the Eastern Christian church as much as in the West? Absolutely, there was, but not to the same level uh, as there was. There was a smaller Jewish population in the historic Byzantine world, or the it, it's the technically it's the eastern half of the Roman Empire, um, which then emerges as as uh, as part of the uh, you know the Ottoman Empire in 1453. But there were there were certainly if if you look for example, and we'll, we'll be talking about it next week of of uh, pogroms in the Jewish Pale Settlement in Russia. In many cases, these are being, uh, Kishinev is a classic example in 1903 in the 20th century. Uh, you have many of the metropolitan bishops who are, are supporting this, are encouraging this, are blessing these people as they're going off to murder Jews in Kishinev and, and in various pogroms. So there's no doubt that there's definitely that hostility. And I would also say that uh, 
anti-Semitism in general historically, and as well as in the present day, is far worse in Eastern Europe than in Western Europe which is strange that its birthplace, modern anti-Semitism is in the nation of Germany. Um, but it was, it was, it's something that always paled uh, uh, by comparison. East Europe, Eastern Europe was always about 100 years behind. So there were certainly those issues. In Islam, it was different because from the standpoint, and, and certainly there were issues, no doubt about it. For Jews and Christians who lived in the Islamic world, they were viewed as, as dhimmi, as second class standing. They, had, they were tolerated. Jews were far more tolerated in the Islamic world than they were in, in the European world. Um, but they had to pay extra taxes, et, et, et cetera. And, but it was a sense that from the standpoint of Islam is a recognition that the, the, the hand of, of, of God or Allah, Arabic for God, touched the head of the Jews first, then the Christians and then the Muslims. And that the, the Bible, you know, beginning of the Hebrew Bible is the word of God, the word of Allah. And just like Christianity would say, well, the finished product is the New Testament uh, to the Jewish Bible, uh, Muslims would say the Quran is the finished product of the book. But the people of the book are to be respected and they are the, they are the, the children of God. They are the children of Allah as well. They're practicing religion that's outdated, but you don't see, and yes, of course, you're going to find uh, the Almohads in southern Spain. There are, are certainly examples of it. But you're not going to see on a larger framework the level of intoleration in the Islamic world historically towards Jews as you find in the European world, first in the Christian stanza and then as well in the modern era. Okay, so you mentioned Islam. I have a question here about, you know, weren't the Crusades a response to the Muslim encroachment? Um, and yet, you know, this whole yellow badge thing, did, did that actually start with the Muslims? Uh, didn't the Muslims also have a, some kind of badge that tended to be yellow that, that identified Jews? They did, and they had it for Christians too. When it exactly originated though, I am not, uh, I am not sure. And like a lot of times it's, uh, for example, the Star of David wasn't prominent in, in ghettos in the Middle Ages. What was more prominent, the color yellow was but the yellow circle uh, that Jews were forced to wear, especially like in ghetto life, which we'll talk about or, 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 or reference as well from the Middle Ages next time, um, the, uh, the circle was a sign of Satan. So it was, it was basically marking it out as a warning that you know, you're dealing here with uh, uh, somebody who's in league with the right. devil. Um, I mean, in Hebrew, they called that a ply. It was some kind of patch that people wore on their clothing that was yellow that were forced to wear. And sometimes it would be a yellow hat. Exactly. It seemed to be that. That yeah. color in Venice, it was red. I don't know why. But um, first, anyway, first, so yeah. give us a hint about what's going to happen next week. So what, we're going to do, what we're going to be doing next week is going to be looking at uh, getting into Europe itself. Because what, what happens is with the onset of the Enlightenment, uh, Christian anti-Judaism is going to decline. Um, it'll be viewed as something in the Middle Ages, backward, hopeless by the vast majority of the population. Not in Eastern Europe because you'll see a, a more of a problem with the Russian Orthodox Church, it'll remain alive and well. And we transition that into you know, this hope with Napoleon Bonaparte and the assembly of Jewish notables. Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, a, a child of the Enlightenment, no doubt, who is going to grant emancipation to the Jews, and it ends up being, in essence, this false dawn, because we'll see the rise of modern anti-Semitism becomes very political, economic, with its birthplace in Germany, It'll be prominent uh, in, in France as well. In fact, I'd say France has a worse track record uh, in Western Europe than Germany has up until the time of the Holocaust. And then we'll get into the, to the 20th century um, and, and, uh, and kind of pull a lot of it all together before we part three into the present and recent Great. present and then into the future. Well, Tim, thank you so much. A lot to think about. Um, I hope people don't have nightmares, but... Um, Yes, so we will continue for the next two weeks. And thanks again to Maureen and her family for Absolutely. the inspiration of this entire program. It's, it's, it's wonderful. I, I can't say it enough. It's, it's strange being, uh, you know, yelling at my computer uh, uh, here over the course of the past hour. But I, I can't tell you how, how wonderful it is to be back uh, uh, seeing you, Jody, and, and, and Maureen as well. And thank you to Maureen and her family uh, and all of you who are out there this evening, too. I, I wish you the very best. Great. So see you all next week. Very Thank good. you so much, Tim. Thank you, Maureen.